in this wilderness area, and probably true in others as well, but what I see is my mind changes. You know, I, I focus on what I'm doing at the time and forget about all that, that superfluous chatter that goes on in your head. And you kind of focus on the present, you know, and that's, that's, uh, there's this wilderness area and more than others is, uh, has subtle beauty. It's not the grand Canyon, for instance, you know, mm-hmm. it's not Yosemite and, and, uh, El Capitan. That's a, it's a subtle beauty of the, of lakes and sunsets and skies full of stars and, and loons calling and, uh, you know, campfire activities and, and being with, friends and taking time to just um, lay back, relax and, you know, sit on a rock in, in your, in your little comfortable chair watching, uh, you know, family of loons swim by uh, and so many things that, that attract your attention that keeps your mind occupied. That's what I find is so enticing about wilderness in general, but especially the boundary waters. Hi, I'm Reed Singh, and this is Adventure Travel with Troop Outside, a podcast where we interview adventurers, local guides, and outdoor industry experts to uncover the best travel spots and human-powered adventures from around the globe. Before we jump in, I have a quick favor to ask you, that if you enjoy the show, please leave us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It would truly mean a lot. Well, welcome, Steve, to the Trip Outside podcast. We're super excited to have a Boundary Water Outfitters on our uh, on our show today. Boundary Water is a special place to us. With it's uh, one of the few places that Julie and I have been visiting for years, uh, starting in about 2014, and we've been doing a summer trip there every single year. And it's a very special place to visit uh, as an annual trip. And you guys are one of the oldest outfitters in the area so we're just really excited <laughs> to have you guys on for Piragas Northwood so welcome. Well thanks so much Reese. great to be with you it's a, it's a beautiful day in winter uh, but we're, we're looking forward to summer next year when um, the sun comes out and the ice melts and and we're back on the water again so we'll yeah, see you then I'm sure. For sure you're definitely looking forward to it early you guys still got like what nine months of winter there <laughs> ahead of you. I know it seems it starts to seem like that when the first snow comes in the middle of October, but you know, uh, that's, yeah. that's the way it goes. We like winter too. Your boundary waters is beautiful in the winter. So, you know, don't discount that, but, and then spring yeah. is really my favorite season. Yeah. That's, that's when uh, everyone's happy or out, things are melting and, you know, you can start to see the silver lighting. Well, exactly. for those that don't yeah. know Boundary Waters, uh, where is it, you know, how as long has this been a wilderness area? Uh, what can, you know, if for the ones in sure. areas that don't know about Minnesota and the, the number of lakes in the area, give us an idea of where Boundary Waters is in general and what are the access points to get to the wilderness and what are the different towns? Sure. Well, the Boundary Waters has, of course, been around since the original Wilderness Act of 1964. It's one of the one of the original ten wildernesses that were designated, and a lot more since then. But it's uh, 1.1 million acres was set aside. Um, it's on the Canadian border, uh, contiguous with uh, the Quetico Provincial Park on, in in Ontario, uh, which is another million acres. So combined, over two million acres of wilderness. That's um, that's shared in kind of a very special geographic area and, and geologic area. Um, the glaciers were nice enough to pass through here and carve out some of this really hard rock into uh, about a thousand lakes and, um, and left behind ridges and, and valleys where are filled with water. And we have contiguous lakes that probably uh, one could paddle for or ski or snowshoe for the rest of their lives and lives and never see at least at my age <laughs> can never see them all because there's so many there's uh uh you know there are people who like to go on trips every year like you do and mark their maps and show the uh, lakes they've been on but after 20 years there's still lots of lakes you haven't been on so it's right. it's unique geographically wow. ge- geomorphologically there's no place really like it on the surface of the earth uh, you know where there's this many lakes in this small of an area on the edge of a boreal forest. 
in such um, an interesting, about, unique way. Go ahead. Sorry, please go ahead. Please. No, I was just going to say you, you asked about um, entry points and, you know, to get into the boundary waters, you need a permit uh, uh, any time of the year, but obviously very busy in the summer. And there are just around our home, little hometown of Ely, there's about 23 entry points. Uh, there are more on the other side. We have two sides to this wilderness. What we kind of look at it as the east and west, and we're the west, we're the Ely entry points. And then to drive around to the other side, the Gunflint side of this um, of this beautiful park, it takes us about three hours to drive around to a place where you could paddle, probably paddle to in about a day and a half. But um, the Gunflint side is the eastern side. It's an access off the Gunflint Trail, and there's another uh, 20 or so access points over there, entry points. So, so okay. lots of ways to get into it. And Ely is sort of, uh, you know, I think kind of is in the in the center of it all. And we we kind of consider ourselves the canoe capital of the world here. Yeah, yeah. There's over what 40 something outfitters in these combined areas, and. Uh... The number of access points really helps. It never really feels crowded at any one of those places, which is incredible how spread out they've uh, put these access points. So basically, if you're coming from, yeah. um, if you're traveling from out of state, your chances are you're probably going to come into Minneapolis, either fly in or now drive in and head up to the Duluth, general Duluth area. And then you're going to go either east or west, whether you go to Grand Marais or go west to Ely mm -hmm. and get... Um, most of the access to the boundary waters is through those two towns. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. A lot of our customers fly from all over the, all over the country. They either fly to Minneapolis and rent a car or they fly to Duluth and uh, we, um, we can arrange shuttles or they rent a car from there. It's an hour, it's about two hours from Duluth to the Canadian border where we're located and in the Ely. So you know, it's, okay. it's pretty accessible. It's one of the most popular wilderness areas in the country. I guess I guess it is the most popular wilderness area in the country with maybe uh, about 80,000 permits given out every year. And, uh, you know, if there's four people in a permit, that's um, 240,000 people. That's, that's incredible. Or is it three, no three people in a permit? <laughs> because when you're in, yeah, there, we, you're in the yeah. middle of the summer, you can lose them really fast. If you go far enough. Yeah, it's the, the Forest Service does a great, the U.S. Forest Service, you know, administers this because it's part of Superior National Forest. So the Boundary Waters is well regulated. And for the last at least 30 something years that I've been here or 40 something years I've been here, we we haven't seen um, a situation where there's tremendous overcrowding in any one place. The Forest Service has designed the system so that you are you enter at a designated entry point that's based on your permit application and once you're in you're in you can go wherever you want and camp as long as you camp on one of the designated campsites so uh it's not like you have to reserve a campsite you just um you, you go you reserve an entry point and from there you're on your own and uh you know this was our busiest year ever and because of the the pandemic people were looking seeking wilderness and seeking outdoor experiences so we've never had a summer quite this this busy in the boundary waters and and we managed to take on more customers and more more uh wilderness travelers than we ever have in the past and and i think everybody had a great experience that's incredible because if they you know the boundary waters is a place that i feel like stays with us um you know the calm and peace and the truly being able to unplug is something that we love about it. And hopefully all of us find some of that peace and, you know, all of your stress, anxieties and all the stuff kind of fall off when you're in there. You may have some different, you're so busy that you don't have time to really think, uh, you know, I feel like being in there, you can relax, but if you're paddling and setting up camp day after day, you're paddling, mm -hmm. you're setting up camp, you're taking down camp, you're enjoying everything that you don't really, um, you don't really miss anything about the city or your phone like we go four days and not even check our phone which is incredible and i think you can Isn't say that, that for a true. lot of backcountry wilderness areas but mm -hmm. i feel like it's so mm -hmm. different because you're on water you're canoeing it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. a typical backpacking trip and the portaging is um it's such a unique experience so if you're you know never been to the boundary waters um is it something that anyone can do if you do you feel like a backpacking experience is required or necessary or 
there's ways to do the boundary waters for even a beginner? Oh, I think it's, I think it's definitely a great place for beginners to w learn about wilderness for their first trips, whether they're, you know, their, their first, their first time, uh, you know, as a student or as a, as a boy scout or girl scout or, um, or as an elder, an elder, you know, who's never done it before because it's a user friendly place as, you know, I think of it as, um, you know, an easy, an easiest, probably the easiest wilderness trip you could do, uh, and still have that real feeling of being in a remote wild place. Uh, we've done a lot of backpacking and hiking and, you know, day hiking and backpacking in the, in the mountains and, and spent a lot of time in the deserts and, uh, you know, it's each, each place has its unique and, and wonderful feel about it, but having a canoe and being able to take comfort items and not have to carry them very much. In fact, there are some entry points where you don't have to portage at all, but portaging sure. is a, is a, a, a beautiful part of the experience really, because you get to see the land as yeah. well as the water. So that's an opportunity to see stuff that you don't see while you're paddling. We, we always take two trips on every portage because we take a lot of stuff and we like to be comfortable and we yeah. don't mind walking the portages twice. So if there's a portage that's a half a mile long, you know, you end up walking it three times, right over back and back again. So you get a mile and a half walk in and you, and you get to see, um, you know, what's growing, what's on, what's in the woods, um, plants and, birds and mushrooms and you know all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't see if you weren't portaging you know next time i think we'll do the same on a few of the portages and slow down at least in the first few days when your packs are still heavy with all the food slow down enjoy the hiking yeah. part of it because a lot of times we're just trying to you know power through the portages because we're trying you know with limited days but we go as far in as possible to get to the remote places but there's a lot of value to enjoying the hiking component of it. It's not just about the campsite and the canoeing. That's, that's it. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Maybe that Yeti cooler will come along next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did that this summer because we took a, a family trip with um, uh, some friends who had three daughters and, and the two of us and, and my wife and I, and uh, we, we did a tow into, you, you can get a motorized tow into some of these more remote places on the sure. edge of the boundary waters one is up the uh, loon river into uh, black lacroix when black lacroix this year was um much quieter than it's ever been because the canadian side of the wilderness is closed so and that's on the canadian border so we had the whole lake to ourselves basically and we took the motor tow we didn't portage at all and we had a we you no know, <laughs> you mentioned it we brought a yeti cooler so we we had cold food and cream for our coffee every day, which yeah. was pretty nice. And, and we saw some beautiful campsites and caught a lot of fish and, um, and hiked a few portages just because we wanted to see what was what you could see off of Lac LaCroix. So there's, there's so many ways to enjoy the Boundary Waters without any portaging at all or doing 12 portages a day for six days in a row if you want. You know, if you're, yeah. if you're young and hardy and you really want to do a, a, a major expedition, you can do it. It's just a different mindset. So, so sure. lots how of ways to... Been, how, long, how, how many years have you been going into the Boundary Waters? When did you start? Gosh, you know, uh, Nancy and I got here uh, very luckily from New England in 1975. Uh, seems wow. like only yesterday to us really yeah. but uh, it's a long time ago i guess and she and i were um, in grad school out at the university of new hampshire studying zooplankton of all things and and uh and limnology and we got a job here in ely and for the summer as contractors with the with the epa with environmental protection agency it was doing a study on shagola lake which is the the lake here right in town that had been had been a little polluted by the city of Ely over the century of mining that had gone on. And um, it was slowly cleaning itself up. And we did um, part of the work that was necessary for a, a, a mathematical model of the lake as it cleaned itself up. And we discovered Ely not knowing anything about Minnesota or uh, the North Woods or the Boundary Waters and just got so lucky to end up right here on the edge of this great wilderness. Fell in love with it our first trip and uh, came back uh, from New England again in 1976 
to do more study on Chagua. And by 19, by the, uh, the end of 1976, we were Ely residents. Wow. So, so what was been here a long time the Bowder, Were they outfitters then, or were you one of the first outfitters and how did you get started into uh, starting Paragas? No, we, we can't claim we're one of the first. There's been outfitters around, uh, especially Ely, since the 20s. Um, wow. You know, this has been a destination for wilderness travel since the 1920s and, and probably earlier. Uh, okay. But it's, it's evolved uh, to be, you know, a major destination since then. And uh, we, we started our outfitting business, our retail and our outfitting business in 1979. So we worked here okay. on a couple of biologic projects for a few years and then and taught at the community college for a couple of years. And by 1979, we were kind of, we had a nice little house in town. We were enjoying and loving the boundary waters and loving this little town of Ely. And we just didn't have anything else to do. So uh, I was interested in, uh, in alternative energy. And I started selling wood stoves out of my garage. And uh, along came a fellow who said, you know, you, you guys love the boundary waters. You ought to sell my, my line of canoes. So I said, yeah, we, you know, canoes are a whole lot lighter than wood stoves. I'd rather sell canoes, <laughs> <laughs> tell you the truth. <laughs> and so we, we, we metamorphosed pretty quickly into a wilderness shop on, in downtown Ely. And over the last 41 years, we've um, kind of grown by accretion. You know, we keep adding on to our store by buying other pieces of property around us. And, and oh, so that's uh, the original location? The point now, that's a massive store that you have now. Uh, yeah, it's not the original location. Now we moved three times before we got here. I think that was okay. about eighty-two by the time we got here and started buying okay. the stores around us. And and now we, you know, we're going to build a new one across the street from us this this next summer. Um, we've kind of outgrown our outfitting division. It's it's uh, building. So uh, part of that building was our our outlet store, uh, and we we've done a it's been a good business for us to uh, have an outlet store. So we're going to build a new outlet store across the street from our, our original store and our original outfitting department or, and expand that business. So, you know, and we're not giving up. We're, we're, we're growing. Um, we're still growing, I think. And my daughter has taken over a lot of the business. So we're leaving a legacy. Oh, that's incredible. Keeping the family. That's uh, refreshing to see, especially in this year of, you know, all these businesses closing, but people finding value in the outdoors and growing. And it's, it's refreshing to know that, you know, you're doing something that's allowing people to allow, you know, love the wilderness, protect it, because we believe if you don't know it, you don't see it, you're never going to sign that petition to stop the mining and all the environmental damage. Yeah. So being on the side of things that, uh, that is helping protect in the you know the environment and nature around there and still be able to make a living and grow is is an incredible thing so what uh what was boundary waters like back then in 70s and when you were started for, first started going were there still designated campsites were you seeing more wildlife less wildlife yeah. what 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 are some of the big differences that you take us back in time I well guess, is what the boundary yeah was. sure well the major the major difference is there were more motorized routes back then the boundary waters was a little bit smaller because okay. there was a, in 1978, there was uh, the Boundary Waters Wilderness Act passed. It was in 64. It was part of the wilderness, uh, you know, a group of wilderness areas in in uh, the United States. But it expanded in 78 uh, with the with the uh, Boundary Waters Wilderness Act. Um, it took away some of what had been designated motorized routes and and snowmobile routes that were within the wilderness. So. You know, it was it was uh, it was a little bit different than some of the wilderness areas out west, which had banned all motorized use. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think Humphrey was, you know, uh, Senator Humphrey and Vice President Humphrey were he was part of this, um, the, the, you know, the, the legislation that initially made the Boundary Waters. And he was kind of hoping to please everybody, you know, including some of the locals up here and the people on the in Minnesota who liked to use motorboats. So, mm -hmm. so but by 78, a lot of that had been eliminated. Uh, the wilderness got a little bit bigger. Um, uh, it, it was a shift, I think, between seeing a lot of people with motorboats on Main Street in Ely to seeing almost everybody with a canoe on their roof. So there's okay. no place in the world, I don't think, where you can go other than Ely, Minnesota, where you'll see more cars with canoes 
than cars without <laughs> in on an August day. Yeah, I love and, the, uh, the wilderness. Too. Yeah, you know, it is, it is it is a unique culture here where people yeah. come out of the woods and talk about what they saw and you know what their campsites were like and what about the wind on Tuesday and gosh, did you see that storm that brewed up uh, Thursday afternoon? And, uh, you know, so it's, it's exciting to be here when you're, when you're amongst a you're really a group of maybe at one time, maybe uh, 5,000 people are in the boundary waters at one time and this million acres of wilderness and yeah. they all have stories to tell. And, you know, the, the thing that impresses me is that we've been here all these years and there's people been here longer than us. Mm -hmm. And these, folks that are now you know i'm i'm pushing almost 70 but uh we get some older folks than even than even old people like me who come in and say yeah, i was here in 1948 uh, when i was a boy wow. scout and uh you know they remember what lakes they were on and they remember the route that they took and and it's, it's just such a memorable thing to people who have done it um uh, it's you know you don't remember maybe where you lived in 19 75 sure. or 1965 but you remember the you remember gosh you remember the lakes you were on and uh you know who was what you were carrying cans back then in in duluth packs and that's changed yeah. you know since then but it's still it's still a beautiful wilderness and the, the tr you know one thing i've noticed too reed is the trees grow bigger you know, a lot of the boundary waters have been logged in the early yeah. 1900s and late late 1800s and since 1975, I I think I noticed that these pine trees, especially the big white pines, have gotten bigger. I, I guess we would expect that, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. It was, yeah, one day yeah. it could be, you know, the primary forest that initially was at some point. Well, it takes or a long time, you know. Close to it. <laughs> succession. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. We can, we can protect it. So that had to be some of the heaviest packs and canoes you were moving around back then. The stoves. The fuel, the canoes are probably all aluminum. Yeah. You just had to, you had to be a lot yeah. stronger back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually, <laughs> you know, my, my dad was a boat dealer in, in Athol, Massachusetts. So uh, he sent me out here with a Grumman canoe. He said, you're going to Ely, Minnesota. You got to have a canoe. And the summer of 1975, I drove my little Volvo out here with a Grumman canoe on the roof, not knowing what I was going to find. And, you know, I took a lot of back roads from Grand Marais to Ely. I thought I was, I thought I was in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden I pull into Ely. It's an oasis. You know, it's this town bustling with people on canoe trips and I've got a canoe. So uh, Nancy and I uh, took off, I think our third or second or third weekend we were in Ely after we got kind of got established with our research. And we did our first canoe trip into Hegman Lake where there's some beautiful pictographs. And that was it. We, that was, you know, love at first sight. Hey, you remember like it was yesterday too. So it must be something about our first canoe trips that really stay with us. Yeah, I remember I couldn't catch any fish. <laughs> I don't know why, but it took me a while to figure out how to catch fish out here. But that's kind of a big part of the experience for us anyway, is having a meal of fresh walleyes or northern pike or, you know, bluegills or whatever it is you're catching. But when you, we always bring the, the cast aluminum griddle and enough oil and batter so that we can always have a fish meal if we're lucky. Yeah. Wow. The cast iron, you were definitely packing, packing well. I'm taking a, a, yeah. a list of well, things to pack should. next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, a little, a little bit of uh, comfort's not such a bad thing. We take, you know, we didn't have these, these beautiful and, and cool lightweight chairs that, you know, kind of dominate the wilderness uh, uh, retail stores these days. And yeah. so now we're, we're getting, we're getting older, but we're getting a little more, you know, a little more uh, relaxed too. So, Clamping. you know, I'm not sitting on a log every night. Yeah. What are some of the, actually, that's a great question. What's some of the new gear that you really like? Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, within the last couple of years, but what's some cool, I know Kevlar canoes is a big deal. Um, yeah. Your backpacking well, yeah. You've got on the list. You're enjoying. You know, Kevlar canoes, of course, now weigh 40 pounds. And my my old Grumman weighed 75, so wow. I, that cut 35 pounds off really quick. Uh, wow. Carbon carbon fiber paddles uh, was what we always use now these days mm -hmm. instead of uh, 
72 inch long uh wooden paddles that we used to use in the 70s so a little little 52 inch long carbon paddle that weighs uh seven or eight ounces you know you gotta you gotta watch out so it doesn't blow away um yeah you know sleeping pads what a difference you know we had we had what white ensolite pads back in the 70s that we slept on and and you know they were about half an inch thick and you could feel every rock underneath you if there was any and nowadays uh, there's you know self-inflating like the nemo pad that you can pump up with your foot it's, with your foot no yeah uh, yeah you pump it up it's three inches thick and you feel like you're sleeping on sleeping at home on you know and and you're on your serta sleeper so um uh that's that's been a big difference uh tents have evolved to become a lot lighter i think we started out with with uh uh you know something that probably weighed 12 pounds and i mean back in the 40s of course then when they were boy scouts were using canvas tents it weighed 20 pounds and sure. our first nylon tent that we used was probably a eureka timberline might have been nine or ten pounds and and now uh, uh, the tents are, you know, four or five pounds. So things have, things have changed a lot. Everything's lighter, but that means we probably bring a little more fresh food. And, and uh, you know, and when we're not portaging, maybe a cooler and some frozen food and, and, some, and some, you know, real, real pleasures like cream in the coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it, That's I, incredible. We, yeah. we can't. You... Go ahead. No, I was just to say, uh, you know, it's funny how you make everything lighter, then you take something that's, you know, that's going to weigh, it's going to make up for some of the, some of what you saved by you know, taking something you don't really need. But freeze dried food is really. Because <laughs> I feel like right, we do that. Exactly. Yeah. We work towards coming out with innovation that's make, supposed to make our jobs easier so we can work less, but we find a way to get busier yeah. than ever. <laughs> with all the technology right. you would think we would yeah. just be sitting back and robots would be doing everything but we keep finding a way to do more and more like well we need we need the exercise buddy you know you yeah. you and i both so yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. keeps us going what you know so, picking up on a, a 75 pound canoe was probably not good for anybody's back or and before that wood canvas canoes that after a week maybe weighed 90 pounds so so everybody's a little healthier now, I think. And they come out of the woods feeling better, and they they go a little further with a little less work, but and you a see a little more wilderness too. because things are lighter. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, getting in on those sketchy rocks, putting in and out, that could be tricky with a really heavy canoe. Yeah, the landings landings are a challenge at times, and um, you know you you carry this canoe on your shoulders upside down which maybe not everybody realizes how you portage a canoe it took us a while to figure that out you know uh, our first trip into hegman nancy and i carried it upright on our shoulders one one on each end and oh. we saw a, a, we saw a guy coming up the portage with this thing upside down on his head and i said how do you do that what you, what how'd you do that he says well there's a thing called a yoke that you it goes inside the canoe and you pick up the canoe and put it on your shoulders upside down. And it looks like a big hat. And I said, well, I gotta get, I gotta get one of those. Cause I had never had one and I didn't know, you know, in New England, nobody portages. So we found out Minnesota has this wonderful technique of carrying a canoe on a upside down on a portage. And, uh, I called my dad who was at, at his little shop and, and Athol and said, uh, you know, Grumman's got something they call a yoke. And he said, gosh, I've had one of those on the shelf here for 25 years. Nobody's <laughs> ever bought it. I'll send it to you. Oh, well, that's great. So, so it worked. They call it yeah, canoe heads. It worked. You see a lot of canoe heads. The canoe heads, yeah. But, well, it, you know, <laughs> if it's raining, you're the guy that's dry. But that, that's, that's the only yeah. benefit, really. And you typically find rain in the Boundary Waters. So uh, if you're coming to the Boundary Waters, what are some things that Piragas uh, – can provide or what do you need to pack on your own like if you're yeah listening to this you're feeling super inspired to go take a trip what and you're like i don't have any backpacking gear what are some things that you recommend you you know bring versus buy or you can rent you know what are the levels of outfitting that you well let's you know that's, there's, there's there's soup to nuts you know um, a lot of people have gear have uh, uh sleeping bags and tents and they bring their own and we supply everything else. Um, a lot of times people just rent canoes from us because they don't have a $3,000 Kevlar canoe and we have 140 of them to rent. So 
Uh, we do a lot of just canoe rentals, but what we call full outfitting out here is everything basically from, you know, sleeping gear and food and cookware and, uh, tents and, uh, the, the canoes and the paddles and all everything that you would uh, tarp, you know, cause it's kind of nice on a rainy day to have a place to sit outside and chairs. If you want to take them, uh, we offer everything. The only thing we don't provide and with some, with a full outfitting party is a water filter because water filters tend to, you know, be used up over time. And we just, we invite our customers to buy their own, bring a water filter instead of us renting them one and, and fishing gear. So, uh, you know, fishing gear can be pretty basic. Um, if you've never done it before and you want, you want to do a canoe trip, it's not a bad idea to buy a license and just buy a cheap rod and reel that we sell those combinations here in the store for 30 bucks. And, a couple of rapples and you know that's that'll get you going probably catch you a lot of fish so so those are the Perfect. things that we don't provide but but everything else you know whatever you need if you want to rent a pack or just a sleeping bag we'll do that too but um a lot of, if you're flying in from new england or if you're flying in from florida or california you're probably not going to want to bring too much with you so right and we i think we as an outfitter, we have the, absolutely the best, the highest quality of every of every piece of gear that you can imagine, and we sell it all used at the end of every season. So we start next spring with brand new gear. The first oh, guy that amazing. rents in the in, when you rent uh, in May, when you're the first one here, you, you're going to have everything that's brand new: tents and sleeping bags and a canoe that has no scratches on it. And it's a little intimidating, but most people yeah. get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the first the scratch of the on the gear, that, the high end gear really adds up if you're out to you know going out if you if you're not sure you're getting into backpacking you're not doing it all the time the you know everything that you guys provide is probably a couple thousand dollars without the canoe even you know so yeah that's, uh, that's a good you know backpackers if you're just taking a trip and backpackers have you know generally uh smaller, lighter, uh, internal frame packs. And we use canoe packs, which are bigger, a little bulkier maybe, but easier to pack and easier to put into a canoe. So, uh, you know, sometimes we'll say, I I know you got, you know, a a $300 backpack that you'd like to use, but really you're going to be much better off just taking one of our, our granite gear canoe packs that, um, go in and out of a, a canoe so much more easily and are almost as comfortable really. So just easier to pack and, and food packs that are lined with um, foam so that they keep the food from overheating and staying cool. And, you know, it's just little things that, that make the boundary waters a little bit different than backpacking and, and, you know, over experience that people have, they learn over a period of time what works and what doesn't work as well. Sure. Yeah, I've got a Duluth pack. It makes a world of difference. So we've got uh, some, like, we'll do from fire round. You, probably questions you get all the time that we can kind of knock out. And, you know, audience is probably wondering, what's the best time to visit uh, in terms of weather? And then two for mm-hmm. meeting the crowds. What do you need to get started? Sure. Okay, mm-hmm. I want to take this trip. Mm-hmm. Um, and what do I need to do before I can just show up? Cause you need a permit and what's the process of getting that permit? Okay. Well, you know, the seasons, the, really the summer season starts here in May ice out. It happens usually at the end of April or the first week of May. So the water's cold. Um, there's, there's no bugs. It's, uh, the fishing season doesn't open until the middle of May. So that first week, there's not many people around. That's for sure. Uh, there are, you know, there are people that show up as soon as the ice goes out and they, you know, they somehow keep track of it and they're here the day the ice goes out, Hmm. but, uh, really good season gets underway, gets, gets busy about the, uh, first of June. Okay. And uh, that's, that's a little bit of a buggy season. People, uh, especially from Colorado, for some reason, those, those folks who don't like bugs, uh, try to avoid the month of June. But month of June is also the most active period of time for birds singing, flowers blooming. It's a it's a beautiful time of the year. And if you choose a campsite on a point out of out in the breeze, the bugs won't be as big a problem as you might imagine. Yeah. July July uh, from about the fourth of July until the middle of August. That's our busiest season. 
uh, lots of Boy Scout groups and Girl Scout groups and lots of families and church groups and port- uh, permits are a little harder to get, but, uh, you know, it's also the warmest season time. It's good swimming. Uh, sure. it's still good fishing. Uh, the, you know, things are, things are mellow cause it's midsummer and it's, and it's warm and, you know, we've had, we do occasionally get a 90 degree day here, but a, a warm day in Northern Minnesota is usually about 80 degrees, 75 to 85, somewhere in there. And, and that's a great time for, for kids, I think, and bringing families and by the by the middle of August things start to slow down a little bit and towards Labor Day we have a very busy weekend on Labor Day weekend but right after Labor Day uh, it's it's relatively uh, low key less people uh, cooler water obviously and nice sleeping you know nights would get cool and and a uh, beautiful time to be out things start to change as and as the as the uh, leaves change and the end of September and into the middle of October and basically, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's lights out about the 15th of October. Things start to freeze up here <laughs> this year, especially, okay. but uh, yeah, that's the seasons. Um, what do you and have to know? You have to, winter, get a, you have to have a, uh, Oh yeah. We do winter. Till, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, when does that start back? Like what there's, there's a date that gets announced that the ice is frozen or, or the lakes are frozen. Yeah. Yeah, we had people ice fishing here last week, but then we had 70 degrees this weekend, so that all ended. Mm. But um, you really, we don't get snow that sticks around until the end of November, early December, and lakes, big lakes, don't freeze until sometimes the middle of December. So if you want to be safe and do a winter trip, I mean, I think it's really from Christmas on till till the middle of April, and uh, you know, cold short days when when you talk about December and January. Um, yeah, we're pretty we'll far north, a, so a full episode on winter yeah. boundary waters trip. Okay, that is, yeah, it's a whole, that would be a whole different story, <laughs> whole different story. <laughs> so, yeah. got it. You know, yeah. uh, best times to visit avoid the mosquitoes in June, great weather in May, September, avoid the crowds in July and August, but great swimming time. So, yeah, ready to go next year. You can still get a permit for 2021. When did the permits open? What's the best way of getting them? Do you get them through you or did they have to go through yeah. uh, government process? Yeah. The forest service has a website, uh, recreation.gov that, uh, the boundary waters is part of that, uh, system for getting permits. This permit system opens at the end of January. Okay. Uh, so it's not open now for next year, but it will um, about the last week of January. Yeah, certainly keep track of it. And with our, our, our website, paragus.com, we, we keep everybody informed of what's going on. Uh, but, you know, you, can, you don't really need to get a permit on, you know, the first day the system opens. A lot of people do, but really there's plenty of permits available and lots of entry points available until – you know, into the summer. Um, this year was exceptional because there were so many people demanding permits so early. But on a normal year, if you wanted to go out in the middle of July, I would think you'd want to have a permit sometime in April or May. Okay. And you know, but if you if you decide last minute, uh, you know, it's July 10th, and you're thinking uh, maybe we'll go next weekend, and you look online, there's still probably going to be a few permits left. They may not be. They might be the entry points where you have to take a portage right away to get into a lake you know sure. there's not going to be drive up and put your boat in the water it's not going to be like lake one or snowbank it might be um you know angleworm which you, <laughs> which right. involves a pretty long portage to get to the lake but that's what's available so start early okay. plan your trip uh call us call an outfitter to help with, with what you need and uh, you know, just, uh, you got to stick to that entry date. So if you chose July 12th, that's the date you got to be here, you know, July 11th or early on the 12th, because that's the only day that you're allowed to enter after that. Once you have that permit, you can, you can basically, uh, stay as long as you want, go wherever you want from that entry point and, and have fun. Amazing. And then what's the difference in, geographical areas between the west and east or is it all pretty much similar um what's the you know if there's a trip where you want to see more wildlife you can take that out of ely or grammar is there is there a preference in 
a difference in choosing your entry point and what you want to do and how does one kind of decide? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we, we like to work with our customers and find out what, you know, what, uh, they have in mind, uh, okay. waterfalls, uh, you know, lots of portages, lots of lakes, um, a round trip, uh, kind of, kind of route where you enter and spend six days traveling and coming back. Um, wildlife is basically ubiquitous. You know, there's probably not a lot of places where there's any more or less wildlife. You want, you know, there's a chance of hearing wolves, maybe even seeing one or two, um, there's a chance of seeing bears, hopefully not in your camp, but, you know, you keep your camp clean and avoid bears. Uh, there's um, uh, always the opportunity to see a moose, you know, mostly while you're paddling on a, on a quiet stream somewhere is a good opportunity to see moose because they're in the water a lot in the summertime. Um, but uh, geomorphologically, no, there's not a lot of difference between the east and the west. Okay. There's just different different routes you know different sure. different amounts of time different amounts of portages some people like 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 our family group you know we just um with our two families we just go into a big lake and get set up one or two campsites over the course of a week and travel do day trips and really relax and fish a little bit and uh, you know uh, in, enjoy the campsite and the conversation and 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 do some hiking into other lakes with, or portaging into other lakes, but coming back to our campsite every night. So that's a different kind of trip than, than day in and day out portaging and finding new campsites and resetting up camp, which we also do. But, you know, it just depends on, on individuals and what they had in mind and what they find enjoyable. Perfect. So trip planning, you guys can reach out to Paragas, reach out to us. We have some other boundary water experts and outfitters. Basically, uh, talk to your group, do a plan. The first thing is get the permit, know what kind of general area where you want to get into, and then start mm -hmm. booking the, the gear that you need, and then trip planning comes next where the outfitters can guide you through. Okay, you got six days, you want to do fishing, here's some good spots along the way, here's some good campsites. And you guys can really help guide that experience where there's not a ton of research yeah. involved beforehand that's great perfect no, Steve. that's true so it's, yeah. yeah this yeah. is there's so much information yeah. here that's for sure this, and when that's what we're here for so you know our uh, we have two guys who run our outfitting department i'm always here we uh, my wife and our daughter so we're always willing to talk to people on on the phone or by email however you want and figure out what would be a great boundary water strip for you Thank you. I'd like to one question that is personal is what is something that you love about the boundary waters that's different from other wilderness areas? I know we've talked a lot about the wildlife and different things, but what do you get yeah. out of it personally every time you go in yeah. and come back out? Sure. You know, you know, I always think about that and uh, it, it's almost uh, subconscious, but when you're at least in this wilderness area and probably true in others as well. But what I see is my mind changes, you know, I, I focus on what I'm doing at the time and forget about all that, that superfluous chatter that goes on in your head and you kind of focus on the present, you know, and that's, that's, uh, there's this wilderness area and more than others is, uh, has, subtle beauty it's not the grand canyon for instance you know mm -hmm. it's not yosemite and and uh, el capitan that's a it's a subtle beauty of the of lakes and sunsets and skies full of stars and and loons calling and uh you know campfire activities and and being with friends and taking time to just um lay back relax and you know sit on a rock in in your in your little comfortable chair watching uh you know a family of loons swim by uh and so many things that that attract your attention that keeps your mind occupied that's what i find is so enticing about wilderness in general but especially the boundary waters 
I hope other people feel that too. I think they do. You know, most people take them a day or two to relax, to get into that mindset. Mm -hmm. And then doggone it on about the day that you're going to come out. It's (laughs) so strange, but you start thinking about the outside world again, don't you? I mean, it's like, Oh no, what did I, why are we doing this? You know, or you (laughs) start thinking about, you know, your first stop for a, a cheeseburger and, and fries, but <laughs> that's okay sure. too, I guess. Yeah. No, I think it really, you said it so well about all the things that we love about it too. The, the presence, the appreciating the small things and the subtle yeah. beauty of, of Boundary Waters. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Uh, we love the Boundary Waters. We want to share this with everyone to hopefully inspire them to take a trip, go out there. If you're not comfortable with the full five-day trip with lots of backpack, bike, uh, backpacking and portaging, you can go for a day trip. But, you know, go up there, explore the Boundary Waters. You find Paragus on tripoutside.com or reach out to them. Thank you, Steve, for coming on. And I hope you have some time to unwind from this busy year. And we'll see you next year. Well, thanks so much for having me. Hey there, adventure seekers. Thank you for listening to another episode of Adventure Travel with Trip Outside. If you enjoyed the conversation, please share it with your friends, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe to stay up to date on where we travel to next. If you felt inspired to travel, go to tripoutside.com. It's the fastest way to book outdoor adventures all in one place.